Is that a last ball? Yes. I got it uh got it used down here at the space dorks. Oh space tones? Space tones. Yeah. I've always wanted to go in there. Yeah. I've never Let seen me just, anybody uh, in there. Before you even <laughs> before you even ask, they are not friendly. No. <laughs> they are the rudest sons of bitches you could imagine. And I just whenever I, I'm feeling too confident or cocky about myself, just go into space dorks because they'll just bring you way down a notch. <laughs> Make you feel real stupid. That's amazing though, because like I said, I've never seen anyone in there and you would think they would just be like all over you as soon as you walk in, but I guess they don't ever see anybody. They're like, God. Yeah, they, they see me walking in and it's like, okay, divorced dad trying to get back into cool shit. <laughs> like we don't have time for this guy, even though he probably has the most money of anybody that's coming in. Yeah. It's a struggle, Jordan. Did you ask him if you could uh, jam out for a little bit yeah. before you <laughs> play, play Stairway to Heaven? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like going in with Wyatt because at least he brings some cred, street cred, because he can actually play. Yeah. So he'll just sit down. Then they're like, and they wake up a little bit. They're like, okay. Yeah. We we have an eater in here. An eater. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, I thought Jen did a great job with the brew thing, and there were a lot more people than last year. Yeah. It was a lot bigger, and it was better produced and and i tell you that laura Merritt at diageo beer company is that her name laura yeah yeah i really like her i know she's no bullshit well um i got to interview her because i think jen had something set up and then she couldn't do it so i hopped in and i was really really impressed with her and she's just really cool and down to earth yeah from texas and you know yeah just, a lot of relatable things and Diageo's doing well. I'm glad yeah. Jen asked her to speak because she brings a little more uh, candid, lively conversation than some other execs. Right. I mean, there Guinness is just, it's just picking up everything that craft is given. I think. Yeah. You know, Guinness is um, what craft brewers drink when there's not any of their beers available. Right. I've I've noticed that for like a decade. If we meet with a craft brewer and they don't have any of their brands, right? It's always Guinness. Always, always Guinness. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And yeah. it's starting to get out there too that it's not a heavy beer. Right. That you know, it's actually pretty light, it's light in alcohol, light in calories. That I think is where they have so much opportunity because everyone is just has it in their head that oh this is a heavy filling beer right it's really the same amount of calories as any light beer right yeah um i was bummed i missed jen's interview with laura i got to see the one with mary lee and she's always always good for some laughs yeah that was good she's no bullshit too no bullshit very accomplished but also like saying stuff that you would not expect anyone to say as a billionaire <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. What a great story. You know, we, yeah. cool teacher. It was a good interview. I yeah. learned a lot about her. I wanted to meet her, but I never really got the chance. And do, uh, are more and more people coming up to you as the podcast guy now? Yeah. Especially younger people. Yeah. Um, although, uh, uh, Ed Miletus came up to me at the airport and said he watches every week. Really? Shout out, Ed. I don't know. Yeah. They've been selling beer up in the Pac Northwest for generations. Um, shout out to our listeners and watchers in North Carolina and Eastern Tennessee and Northern Florida. Good Lord have mercy. We are still assessing the damage. It looks like Sierra Nevada came out generally unscathed, minor damage that they were going to be able to repair. They'll probably be in, back in production maybe next week. They, if they, I don't know if they have power. But New Belgium, on the other hand, looks uh, pretty bad. They took on water, definitely. You've seen the pictures, right? Yeah, the pictures look bad. Fortunately, they said that uh, the damage wasn't as bad as the pictures appeared. But, I mean, breweries are built so that the bottom few feet are waterproof, obviously, because they're just big drains, Yeah, you know, when they have to flush beer and stuff like that. All right, today we'd like to welcome to BearNet Radio Adam Craner, CEO and co-founder of Carbless, the spirits-based RTD that's getting that's gaining a lot of share right in the middle of the country, uh, founded right before COVID. 
think they're looking to do about 3 million cases this year, up from about a million and a half uh, last year, just ex exponential growth. And you guys are actually the top spirits-based RTD in your home market of Wisconsin, where you have about twice the dollar sales of high noon in scans. So we're going to dig in, but welcome, Adam. Thanks for having time for us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. And I appreciate you calling out those numbers because it's always better when somebody else does it. Yeah. <laughs> like, Come on, guys, you got to believe me. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're an independent news outlet. So we... I will yeah. throw a, a few challenges out to you and say uh, we 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 generally replicate that in markets that uh, we're fully distributed in, usually for you know around a year or more. So when you look at the trends of 52 weeks and you start looking at 26 and 13 and four, uh, a lot of times we see that to be very directional of where Carbless ends up in 52. So check out Minnesota, check out Iowa, check out Convenience, Mulo. Um, and uh, if you have reporting on North and South Dakota, check that out as well. Yeah, no, uh, really interesting. So then how much of your business would you say you do in, in Wisconsin proper, where, where you're based? Um, so three years ago, it was probably closer to about 90% uh, because mm -hmm. we didn't, we, we weren't launching anywhere else yet. Um, and so now it's down to around 30. And uh, the beneficial piece is Wisconsin continues to grow leaps and bounds, but that number is shrinking, which is just... Um, you know, shows that the other markets are growing at, at a pretty significant pace and home market is continuing to grow. Even to this day, we're in, you know, probably a lot of D accounts considerably for a distributor. Um, and our rate of sale still has not decreased on average, uh, which is some, some fun math. Awesome. Well, listen, we've gotten to finally talk to you after a year or two of people telling us, hey, you got to check out Carbless. They're doing a lot in our backyard, right? <laughs> And so uh, finally we broke through, but for our listeners who aren't super familiar with you guys, they obviously don't read us if that's the case, but how have you guys broken through? Cause you're a spirits based RTD. There's a lot of spirits based RTDs there out there, right? You guys are low cal. You do several different spirits bases. I think low sugar, low carb, or maybe uh, no carbs, right? Correct. How are you breaking through getting to people amid all of the other brands out there? Yeah, um, I'm going to try to do this without using um, competitive products, um, but I, I usually do just to kind of understand where where that market sits. The market, in my opinion, sits in two, in spirits-based RTDs, is, is two sets of products. There is the premium version of the malt-based seltzers. So those I would call to be higher in carbonation, maybe moderate in carbonation, lower flavor, an appealing nutrition panel, somewhere between two and five grams of sugar and carbs but not very flavorful. Mm -hmm. Then you have the other, you know, cocktail in a co can. I'm making a vodka cranberry. I'm making a um, margarita in a can, right? Those are generally going to be about 12 or 13% ABV, uh, 350 calories, 35, 40 grams of carbs, 35, 40 grams of sugar. So if you're tracking any macros, they taste great. Uh, and I will support that notion all day long. But if you're tracking macros, you're not going to want it. The concept of Carbless is to blend those two markets and put it in one can. So for instance, the vodka cranberry is a vodka cranberry in a can. And if you were drinking a vodka cran that the bartender made you, and then you were drinking our vodka cranberry, and after you got done, I told you, hey, that's only that's only 100 calories, it's zero carbs, zero sugar. And then usually the immediate reaction is, holy crap, I didn't know that could taste this good. So the concept is... A lot of flavor, just like a bar crafted cocktail, mimicking that lower carbonation level, but the nutrition panel that everybody loved in the seltzers and all of ours are zero carbs, zero sugar, hundred calories and gluten free. So the, the name carbless is kind of a play on words because it has no carbs and low carbonation. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so that name comes from my, my beautiful wife came up with that. Um, and it, it started as just a play. It, now, mind you, I'm from the cheese world. Um, I'm from Wisconsin, so as cliche as it gets. But <laughs> um, I, I didn't know what carbonation volumetrically or units or specs looked like, right? So the name at first was all carbohydrates mm. um, because we had zero carbs. And that was why it's the result of us doing the keto diet. And the word carbless has become very synonymous, to your point, with the lower carbonation uh, because we find people... They don't necessarily love no carbonation. They don't necessarily love a ton of carbonation, but having a little bit just to play around on your palate uh, makes a lot of sense. Coming from the the cheese world, um, have you been able to take any of that and apply it to this industry? And who is kind of 
helped you navigate your way through BevAlk and, you know, what have been kind of some of the eye-opening things yeah. you've learned? Um, so cheese, uh, the, the fun fact is I would say uh, there's, there's a few different pieces. One, the guy that replaced me at that plant is now our director of ops. Um, an HR manager or HR director that I worked at at that plant is now our uh, head of HR. Um, so those pieces have traveled quite well. So when I first tried negotiating with a distributor in the cheese world, what we would do is let's say you were contracted to do 750,000 pounds, for example. And then somewhere we would have something written in the contract that would say, if you hit a million pounds, we'll give you a discount of two pennies a pound. And that will be retroactive for everything that we produced this year. Maybe it was a penny a pound. So usually November, December, it would create a huge like shift in volume because people could produce more and coupon and still make make money. And, and we were, you know, filling the volume. So my first distributor that I was uh, trying to do pricing with, this is in 2019 before I had anybody smart on, on the team. Um, I tried doing that. I said, hey, if you buy this much, here's the price. And if you buy this much, here's how we discount it. And the distributor goes, yeah, that's not how we do it. I was like, okay, well, then you're paying the highest price, not realizing that they just put their margin on top. The retailer puts their margin on top, and then suddenly it's on the shelf at X price. Um, so that segues into uh, Mike Dempsey is our executive vice president. Uh, he's worked for uh, Pete's Wicked Ale, Mike's Hard Lemonade, Shaker's Vodka, um, a lot of other um, spirit-based ready to drink as well. And so he came on, he was our second hire, came on board in 2021, about a month and a half after I quit my job. And um, he's been instrumental in one, helping out build out the sales team and our process and helping us understand uh, really the, the right route to market strategy for our brand and the right distribution partners. Yeah, nice. Well, in terms of distribution partners, are you guys pretty AB heavy? Because earlier, well, like, first of all, I know you have a couple of AB wholesalers, but also when you were describing your product intrinsics, it kind of sounded like a cut water marrying just a seltzer, right? <laughs> so it fits right in the AB wheelhouse, but I know you might have others as well. So it's, it's funny you say that because when we do talk with the um, the AB distributors. I use neutral as the seltzer one and, and cut water as the, the ready to drink. And it's it's true, right? And I part of the way that can be beneficial is they can all work together because they are different products. Um, we have two different spirits uh, houses. And then we're probably, if, if you're not including spirits, we're probably 65% AB, 35% Molson Coors. And that's not uh, intentional. Uh, we don't really have a, a necessary allegiance. We go into the market and we look for the best distribution house that's there. And that's outside of their words. It's, you know, the market. It's when we go into the market, who's got point of sale up, who's got tap handles. Uh, we're looking at all that. And how eager are you to expand into new markets? Because I know you've got this very concerted, you know, straight down the middle of the country, basically uh, footprint just touches probably under 20% of the U.S. population. So is that a slow and steady march national or how do you look at that? Yeah, uh, it's slow and steady for two reasons. Uh, well, probably more than two, but it, it started out as strictly a cash play. Um, well, first goal has always been to be a personable brand. So you can't be personable and then go national tomorrow. So we intentionally hire market managers. Um, for example, we're, I'll tell you, we're going to go into part of Kansas next week. And that person who's going to own that territory started three weeks ago. Um, and so the, the methodicalness is one to saturate the market. So we'd rather be narrow and deep than wide and shallow. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of brands that are hot for six months. And then two years later, everybody's like, what, what, you know, I haven't heard of it. Everything we do is for this to be a brand in 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and so that's part of the strategy. And it used to be cash-based. Um, I didn't want to fundraise venture capital. We have one angel investor that gave us money in 2021. And now we've got uh, an amazing partnership with Bank of America that as of April of this year, cash is no longer our constraint to growth. We have a very healthy, profitable business. So I don't have a reason to need to grow faster and outside of pride. And I've, I learned a long time ago to cut that out. Um, but the other part is now that we have the cash, we could just run around and grow. But in order to do it right, that means I'm going to be on the plane even more than I already am. Mike's going to be on a plane even more than it already is. All of our sales team, all of our business development. And it's like, what's it worth? If you already have a healthy business, why burn everybody out? 
Absolutely. Kind of like the, well, bigger, but I'm sure you've heard of this by now, the new Glarus model kind of, right? Just own your backyard, right? And that still works. Nobody's done it better than Deb at new Glarus for sure. And, you know, it's almost, I think, a benefit to come from the Midwest. You know, and when I say Midwest, I include Pennsylvania in that. There's a lot of people that start in Pennsylvania and the Midwest. And the and if they're successful there, which are the hardest markets, then you can go to, you know, Florida, Texas, California, where the volumes are are there if you're already established. Anyway, I'm just preaching the choir here. But it's I think the I think you're right. The narrow deep and the slow burn is definitely the way to go because there are so many brands that don't make their sophomore year. Yeah. Well and Harry, you, I, I think that was Harry, sorry. Kind yeah, of, that's me. Uh, when you say preaching to the choir, that's that's been a learned thing. So out of the gate, you said back, uh, backyard to backyard, I think, Jen. Um, that is uh, a, a bit of a coin phrase in Wisconsin from Craig Culver. Um, and if you know what a Culver's is, it's because he did backyard, backyard. Yep. But, um, you know, the first two sets of consultants that we had before we had Mike on board was exactly what you said. Adam, you need to go to California. You need to go to Texas. I get you want to do this backyard. That's not where the volume is. You don't know what you're doing. You're not from this world. And I was like, okay. And the first year and a half, if I wasn't working full time, we would have lost our business because we just did nothing but purge money. Uh, And there wasn't really any value. Uh, The distributors didn't know how to sell carbless. We as a brand didn't know how to support the brand. Um, So it was kind of a detriment from from the start. And um, we've now got an incredible team that, that knows how to activate quite well. Go ahead, Jeff. Oh, well, my last would just be how the hell are you guys keeping up with supply, right? You have just such exponential growth. Is that a, is that a pain point? Um, and if you would share where you guys co-pack. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, so my world in the world of cheese, I was in continuous improvement and then ended up in operations management. So everything that we were about was making sure we had enough inventory for the sales team to sell. Now, I will tell you the last even though you saw great growth, 23, even 22, we ran out of inventory both those years. This was the first year with our partnership with Bank of America. And so that's why the cash was always an issue. Even though we're tremendously profitable, I still didn't take a paycheck for the first four months of this year in order to put every dime I could into inventory because I think it'll pay us out in spades. Um, So we, we did limit ourselves. We always tried to have that even balance where when we're launching a new distributor and we'd only launched you know five seven counties at a crack our current distributor should not be paying for that um and so there's a few times that it happened and uh, we we made it a very intentional piece to not have it happen this year um so bank of america literally helped solve that and i'm very thankful for them uh because as a startup doesn't matter how profitable you are every bank just wants to kick you down another six months which is a long time in this game and the inventory are... sucks cash right oh. I mean... It's just a brutal cycle, but you know, you're going to get your money back once it sells through, but you just need that time. Correct. And and when you think about the hot time for like, we, we don't have a ton of seasonality because uh, we do quite well in, in less seasonal uh, channels, but at, at the same time, everybody's busy in the summer. So if we are trying to make a knee jerk reaction in the summer and our natural colors take 90 days to procure, if we're out in June, we really can't make it up outside of plan probably until September when the summer's already done. So we have to prepare for that January through March. Um, To answer your question on who our supply partners are, our first two, I will tell you, were horrendous. Um, I will not name names, but coming from that world, I thought they all acted like I did with pride. And um, our very first manufacturer to this day says our product was the reason that they leaked. And I'll tell you that they're the only manufacturer we had that issue with. Um, so that tells me everything we need to know. Uh, the ones that have helped us build this company are Red Boot Distillery, or now Red Boot Beverage in Des Moines, Iowa. They were our very first to be able to do well. Impact Brewing in Cincinnati, Ohio. If you've ever seen the Taft brand, Taft uh, Brewery, I think only sold in Ohio. That's who they were. I think they're retracting from that and focusing on um on contract manufacturing now. And then we have three in Wisconsin. Pilot Project, uh, who has a place in Chicago as well. They have uh, they bought the old Milwaukee Brewing, old Paps place in Milwaukee. Fortress Nutrition in New Berlin. And right now, Wisconsin Brewing Company 
is doing some as well out of Verona. Man, you've got the you've got a good core Midwest co-packing team there. You can't, you know, you can't lose with the Midwesterns. They, they, those people, they're honest. They're going to tell you the truth. I'm just making blanket statements here, but I just, that's just what I love. I, Iowa is my favorite state. Everybody knows that. I, I even go to Des Moines in January. That's how much I love it. So, yeah, that's probably more than most. Love yeah, that. right. <laughs> Um, I, I will add that. So our goal is to be within one day of every um, w within all of our distributors as we scale nationally. So there will be maybe a year to crack where we're behind that or ahead of it, depending on. So we're kind of done in the Midwest uh, from that perspective. We've already got, you know, looking at some partners out in California and Texas, which gets us west of the Rockies and a little more south. And then um, we're looking at a partner up in Canada as well to support the Northeast. So. We've got that piece to your point about how do you look at it? Like we've, that's just as much prep as sales is for us. And part of that is, I think I have a passion for ops, so I don't let it get forgot. <laughs> mm. That's great. That's very important. So you're ahead of 90% of the people out there in this space for sure. Maybe, maybe higher. Well, you know, just building the brand in the Midwest. I mean, those are big beer states, um, Wisconsin's big craft, um, you know, how did you spread awareness of the brand and what did you do to, you know, get people to drink it during the freezing winter months and, you know, the, just the marketing aspect of building this brand? So marketing, I, I will just caveat with traditional marketing, billboards, radio, TV. Um, our mantra is we only market where we sell. Um, so we, we do not activate with big dollars. We, we spend money once we know we have a foothold. Um, and if you go back, so my first year and a half, I was working full time, um, Monday through Friday, working 12 hours a day, but I still did about 10 samplings a weekend before I even knew that was the, really the right thing to do. Um, festival foods in Wisconsin took us on right away. So I just did festival roadshow like every weekend. Um, and part of the reason is what I just explained to you guys, like we have a huge competitive set, right? There's, there's a ton of big name, big dollar competitors. There is no product like ours. And I will stand on that hill uh, right now. There is no product like ours. And there hasn't been for five years. So when your product is a star, liquid to lips, which is now, you know, a coin phrase from everybody in the Bev Elk world. I didn't know that five years ago. But so we literally started with just sampling off-prem all the time. Part of the ignorance on my end is I viewed expansion as an account. I didn't understand that total wine could sell hundreds a month and a bar can only sell four a month um, or 20 compared to a thousand. So when we were looking to grow the brand and get more visibility, we just started with accounts, uh, did not focus on high volume accounts or I didn't know any of that stuff to look at, just tried getting more accounts. And um, just so happened, I was very comfortable in the bars uh, as a typical Wisconsin person. Yeah. <laughs> that is a, listen, that's an underrated trait, but very important. <laughs> very important. I've heard of that you as an underrated trait, but I'm taking that and running with it. No, for sure. If you do, if you can't hang out and dive bars, then you have no business being in this business. <laughs> you, can, you Kids, write that down. Write it down. <laughs> uh, Uncle that, Harry's honestly, That's a true statement. Yeah. Yep. Well, I, I want to get back to the competitive set because I have a question there. But first, you know, you mentioned um, accounts and high volume. Um, are you moving or you're eyeing more high volume accounts like venues or, you know, um, any uh, the sports are big there? So, um, so it goes back to uh, and and I, I will probably sound like a, a, you know, crappy record on repeat, but uh, we only market where we sell. So we did activate with the um, Milwaukee Brewers last year. Um, I think they are one of our top on-premise accounts in the state. And also we 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 are very 50-50 male-female and we aim to continue that. Um, and so we we like sports as an avenue to, to kind of keep the male consumer engaged. Uh, we did extend that with Detroit Tigers this year, Detroit Red Wings, Minnesota Twins. Um, we're activating with a lot of AAA teams. I've probably had 10 or 15 NFL, MLB teams reach out of all, like the Yankees. Um, we don't sell in New York. So I'm not, people in New York see my logo isn't going to do anything for me. What about so, Packers? 
Come on. Well, I actually said this. I said this to them, so I'm comfortable saying it on here. Uh, they think the value of their brand is a lot higher than I do. Um, <laughs> so, so I think about it in activating liquid to lips. The brewers have 2.5 million people that will walk through AmFam Field, and I pay X. The Packers will have 700,000 people walk through Lambeau Field in a given year. So my math says I should pay around 25%. The fact that their number is uh, greater than 100% says absolutely not right away. Gotcha. Okay. Well, going to the uh, competitive set, uh, I think with a few years of Spirits RTDs under the belt now, we've kind of learned that extensions don't work that well or they don't cycle that well. They might um, pop up and then kind of go to the wayside after a year. And it's all the new to world, new to market brands. Um, obviously, you're one of the top ones in that uh, bucket. So why why aren't the extensions working in your view? Uh, in my view, I'm going to try to, again, do this without calling out any brands. Um, <laughs> so I would say some of the ones that went from malt to spirits, um, the customer is confused. Uh, one of those products is the reason that we are in existence. And I will tell you that out of the gate, I didn't know they were malt. It's a clear product. Must be vodka. So when all of a sudden, still to this day, bars and restaurants don't understand that we get taxed 10,000% more as a spirit-based item, and they don't understand why they have to pay 75 cents extra for a can, which in the grand scheme of things is a lot, is, isn't that bad when you think about the taxation. So I think customer confusion and blurring the lines of what the product is that was beneficial during that time is making it harder to transition into spirits-based. Um, and then I'll say for some of the line extensions that are pre-mixed, if you take your favorite whiskey, right, you go to the uh, restaurant and you say, oh, I'll take a X whiskey and a Coke, probably. Well, when you mix it with cola, you've already alienated the customer a bit because they want it with Coca-Cola. And then now even when you look at the mixture of Coca-Cola, well, maybe it's 7% ABV. I don't know what they're pre-mixing in the can. But if I drink it at 12, you've not really made it any easier. Uh, maybe, maybe I like to drink it light at two and a half or three. And now you've mixed it super heavy. So like I I understand the benefit of ready to drink in a can. That's why we did it. I think the challenge that they're having with line extensions is because the customer's perception has already been created. Um, with with this, we get to, oh, sorry, I got that weird thing, but we get to create the perception. And then the flavor is so cohesive and consistent as where with the other brands, when you say I'm drinking whiskey and cola, and I go to the bar and drink whiskey and cola, I expect it to taste the same. As soon as it doesn't, the customer feels alienated and this isn't what I like anyway, so why would I buy it? That's my perception. Be because it is it is true that if you want to have a successful RTD in a can, you got to have a new to world brand. <laughs> right? I that like is... your reasoning. Yeah. <laughs> these, these rum and Cokes are hot, but not for a Louisiana band. I can't. Is this a Friday Harry rap? Like what? It sounded like you should be putting a fiddle on the band. But I'm, right. I'm trying to do a callback, Jen. I don't know. Yeah. If these podcasts, but my <laughs> hey, my regular eaters will know what I'm talking about. One little thing, Adam. You know, to your point, talking about expectations and convenience and all that. I used to say, you know, who the hell is going to drink a blank and blank in a can? Right? Who's going to drink a rum and coke in a can? How lazy? Do you have to be to not open your handle of rum and crack a can of Coke, which is sold at, sold at a liquor store everywhere. And then I swear to you, one night I was like, I cannot do one damn thing but pop a top of a can. Like, <laughs> Where's my can? You know, that's also similarly, if you've ever heard the, the song, it's getting hot in here. So take off all your clothes. Just, you know, I was like, that is the most ridiculous thing. And then one day, anyway, yeah. but I digressed. Listen, Jen, that happens to me every day. <laughs> every I'm, day. I'm not talking about the hot in here. I'm talking about being lazy. So just to yeah. be clear, folks, <laughs> Harry always has his clothes on, even when he sleeps. He even literally when he exists bags. in a can because I'm lazy. Yeah. I got sick of making it. Yeah. yeah. No, we're busy. You don't have to be lazy to need convenience. <laughs> we are busy. But you know what? I want to ask you something that I should have asked in the beginning, which is, you know, what are your top flavors, top packages? Um, black raspberry four pack is our top flavor. Uh, every single market, with the exception of Arkansas, once in a while, month by month, it'll skew below a point or two cranberry. Um, 
we sell so many four packs that we are, I think, the first brand in the space to come out with 12 packs that are straight case, um, mainly because consumers are like, I'm sick of loading up with five of them. Can you please make a bigger pack? Uh, Black Raspberry uh, is the the market leader and therefore my financial favorite. <laughs> <laughs> my financial favorite. Oh, that's good. And then, I mean, how into innovation are you guys? Is that something that you're more conservative with? Do you have any new big plays pl coming? Well, I would tell you, I feel like we're conservative, um, but also when we launch a new market and they find out that we have uh, 16 flavors, that doesn't feel very conservative. Um, we're we're pretty strategic in the way we go to market. Um, so I, I would consider ourselves conservative. And when we put something out, we're not going to necessarily put it out to topple Black Raspberry. But we're going to put something out that we can almost guarantee there's a customer for. Um, I'll use uh, the example of grape. I know there's a lot of good transfusion drinks out there. Welch's crushed the grape game, you know, 30 years ago for me. Um, but if you look in the Bevel category, what is really selling well in grape? And so when you look at the data, we might have customers asking for it, but there's nothing that's really proven. Uh, we'd really go prefer to go after something proven and just make it better. You have to ask, just because you guys are such a hot brand, I know you have the partnership with Bank of America. Are you guys looking for any other partnerships? Uh, as far as raising capital? Raising capital, capital, do you see an exit in a few years, right? Although you did say 20, 30, 40, but you know. I mean, I'm I'm sure we will. Um, I, I love this space, but the opportunity that that brings to family, our team is, is pretty tremendous. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, five years ago, that wasn't part of the plan, but um, yeah, that'll happen in time. Um, and it's time and partnership. If, if, you know, you've maybe heard one thing, we, we don't do something because everybody else is doing it. Cause at this point we would be national like most others. Um, we do it when it's right for the brand and there is self inflect, uh, uh, self introspect that I look at is okay. I, re uh, I was able to lead it to 1 million, then 10 million, then 50 million. When am I no longer the guy? Um, and, and what does that, what does that look like, uh, for the brand, the team and, and team included, everything we look at is for the brand. It's, it's the baby that you have that you want everybody to know about. And at some point it'll make sense for somebody to do it better, faster, stronger than us. And when that time comes, um, then that, that's probably a logical next step. Absolutely. Well, Self-aware. Okay. Well said. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's actually, that's just about exactly what I was about to say, Jen. It seems like you have a, a really good head on your shoulders and like you're doing it the right way. And uh, it also sounds like you got a tiger by the tail. So congratulations on that, Adam. Thank you. And and we appreciate you uh, coming on BeerNet Radio. This is the podcast where all your dreams come true. <laughs> I like that so, a lot. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to have expectations be too high, but... All your dreams will come true. I'm pretty sure. So congratulations on that. <laughs> <laughs> we need some music yeah, yeah. in the background, like slowly getting higher. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, hit the smoke machine again. All right, guys. Well, y'all have a great weekend and we'll shout at you later next week. Awesome. Thank you. Thank Can't you guys. Appreciate your time. You bet. Thank you.